So, uh, yeah, my main goal in this talk is to basically introduce a different way of um, looking at parallel computation um, and convince you, hopefully, that one needs to look at communication complexity at least as much as computation complexity. So, just as a little bit of evidence that uh, communication is the more important thing in many cases. Um, for those who don't know, uh, since 2004, uh, clock rates on computers have not increased. So the only way to actually get more computation done is to get many computers. And there are many examples of that. Uh, multi-core machines, we all have multi-core machines on our laptops. Data centers that have hundreds of thousands of machines. And cell phones, right? Cell phones are computers, and uh, we can do some kind of distributed computing tasks on those things. Sensor networks, I'll talk about more. OK, so what I want to claim is that the most expensive part in time, energy, money, anything you want to measure is the communication rather than the computation. So. Let's look at uh, the kind of standard communication uh, architecture that you have in machines. You have basically a bunch of machines, and they're all connected through one shared channel, Ethernet usually. And there's two types of communication. You can do peer-to-peer, -peer, so from one machine to another. And you can do broadcast. You can, from one machine, tell all the other machines some, some information. Um, and the interesting thing is that broadcast takes about the same time as peer-to-peer -peer because it's really how much time you need the channel. And the independent communi the communication time when you do broadcast is independent on the number of receivers. Okay? So is time the same as bandwidth and money? Or? Uh, bandwidth is a little bit different. I mean, here I'm talking about both bandwidth and latency, but I don't want to get too much into it. Yeah. GPUs as also having the problem of uh, at a different level, right? So you can talk about many other levels of communication, like the whole memory hierarchy is about communication from slow memory to faster memory to even faster memory. GPUs have, everything has basically an I.O. bottleneck of some <coughs> level. So, but I'm not concentrating on that right now. I'm concentrating on the standard kind of situation where you have a bunch of standard computers all connected through Ethernet. <coughs> okay, so there is a standard model for dealing with this. It's called the bulk synchronous parallel model, which is uh, what uh, Valiant uh, invented in 1990. And this is one part of theory that really had a huge effect on practice. So MapReduce, Hadoop, Spark, they're all based on that. They're all based on this idea. And the basic protocol is the following. Masternode distributes jobs to workers. Workers work. Then the workers send their result back to the master. And then there is a barrier, OK? So the master waits for all message before starting its next iteration. And it's also called, in more hardware setups, it's called barrier synchronization. OK, so let's look a little bit in more detail how this behaves in real time. Um, you have a master and a bunch of uh, workers. And here is the time arrow, OK, going from top to bottom. So in a single iterations of this bulk synchronous, the master broadcasts to all the workers some information. Each worker does their work. And um, then the workers communicate back to the master. Now, the communication back to the master cannot be done broadcast, because it's only to the master. So you do it peer to peer. And that can take a long time, because you cannot only one, this is a shared shared resource, the channel, OK? So if you have this machine communicating back, and then this machine communicating back, and then this one, and then this one, 
finally this one. Okay, you have to basically make that as a sequential thing. That's just the way things are designed. Okay, so, um, so there are two problems here. One is that this is statistical. So workers don't start exactly at the same time and they don't take elect exactly the same time. The second one is that all workers have to communicate back to the, to the master before continuing. Okay. So what slows down barrier sync parallelization? There are two, essentially, two, two combined problems. One is called the laggard problem, which is that when you have a large number of machines, one of the machines will be much slower than the others. It's just the way things are. And so you have to wait till the slowest one finishes before you can go to the next iteration, while the other ones are just doing nothing. The other is the bandwidth problem, which is that collecting the results back to the master before continuing to the next iteration uh, requires point-to-point -point communication from each worker. And so the communication time increases linearly with the number of workers. And this actually quickly dominates computation time. So I've been actually working with these kind of things and I was initially really amazed. I would look at my cluster computing as fast as it can and then I'm looking at the CPUs, how loaded they are, and they're loaded at like 5%. So this is, I believe, the reason. Okay, so what I'm going to suggest here is a new protocol that is trying to basically improve on BSP. There's going to be no synchronization. There's going to be no master. And there's going to be no peer-to-peer. -peer. There's going to be only broadcast. Okay, so let's start with a very simple example. Suppose we have n coins, and most of the coins are unbiased, half and half. And one, or some of the coins, are biased. Half minus gamma, half plus gamma. And our goal is to find the biased coin. Okay. So, um, if we're using the synchronized model, the, the border, boundary synchronized, we have computer J flips uh, coin J. So we give each computer a, a coin. And and, um, oh, oh, I didn't even, I'm sorry. I, uh, should I, first of all, I want to basically describe the, 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 the not so good way to do it, which would be that every computer does a mini batch, like flips the coin some m times, and then communicates the sum to the master, and the master decides. That would be the batch uh, method um, with the problems that I said. Here is a method that is completely different and unsynchron unsynchronized. So the computer J flips coin J and generates this binary sequence. And then it uses this test. So after each flip, it checks whether the sum of the xi, absolute value, is larger than some alpha plus beta t. Okay. And if that happens, then it broadcasts to everybody. Here, I found the coin. Okay. Wait, what's J? Uh, what was J? Broadcast. Is the number is is the coin? Is the index of the coin or the computer? Right. Each computer has a coin. Oh, got it. Okay. okay. So basically, they're all searching, and once one of them finds it, says, "I got it," sends it out. Okay, so how do you analyze this? This is based on wall sequential test. So um, um, if you have a binary sequence um, like this, random coin flips, um, then you have this log ratio test that uh, wall designed and um, you can show, uh, unlike Chernoff bounds that basically work for a particular time step and you can of course you can uh, spread delta and so on, but this is a very simple test that, um, that is guaranteed to make a mistake only with probability uh, delta, right? So how does this look? Uh, how does this look in practice? It looks something like this. So here I have groups of coins, 
coin flips. This one is unbiased. This one is biased with P0.6. And this one is biased with P0. Point, no, this is not. Oh, yeah, P0.6. So it's z uh, 0.1 more than half. Uh, this is P of 0 0.7. And this line is the wall test. OK? So what is the advantage of wall test is that Yes, it, it will not accept something with um, bias, uh, with high probability, it will not accept this one. And it will accept this one at some point, and it will accept this one at some point. But the main point to see is, if your bias is bigger, then you'll detect it sooner. So you don't have to decide ahead of time how many times you're going to flip the coin. It will basically, based on the assumption that is inherent in in where you place this line, it will stop sooner if the bias is bigger. So that there's no tuning based on the bias? There's no, no, there is a tuning based on the bias. That's the slope of this line. Ah. And, and the slope of this line is basically the bias that you're shooting for. So that's the minimum bias. Okay, got it. And then the, the, the shift is how sure you want to be, right? The more shift, you, because at the beginning, you know, you have like these things going up and down. So the shift is basically how sure you want to be. Does this have a, the subject to having this property that you, you, you're never wrong and you're always right, does this have the, like, the minimal, say, expected uh, stopping time? Uh, well, it is the optimal rule in the sense that it is, it, it, it actually, what it tests is exactly the log ratio. So, so, so basically, in, in what sense can you say that it's optimal? Um, in deciding between two alternatives, like less than or equal to 0.5 or greater than or equal to 0.7 um, in terms of the expected number of observations. Yeah, yeah. So it, it has, yeah, it has nice property, um, optimality properties. You, have, you have n points. I mean, between two alternatives, I understand the optimality, but now you have a right, right, right. No, that's true. So I need to. Imp so what I need to to correct for is I need to sh change the shift of this so that it will account for probability delta over n. Right. Okay. right. So so it's just another shift here. Uh -huh. Yeah. I guess another way to ask is: Is it possible that there's a nonlinear rule that has a better expected stopping time? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I, I suspect that there should be, my, my intuition is that there should be a rule that behaves like square root. But I don't know. I know about this rule and its proof is so extremely basic, fundamental, that it seems like it would be hard. But, but I don't really know. OK, so what do we get from this? The time spent is the time to find the most biased coin plus one broadcast. OK, but this is good for what? So it's actually the basic step in boosting, right? So if you think about it, it's exactly what boosting does. Uh, and this is a way to do distributed asynchronous boosting. OK, so let me, uh, let me talk about that. So add a boost. Um, in each iteration, you have to find a weak hypothesis, and you add it with some weight to the sum. And then you reweigh the examples. And the weak hypothesis is exactly this. The error of h minus a half is equal to gamma, which is larger than 0. OK? So, so this is exactly a biased coin. Right? So, um, so how am I going to do this? So first of all, initialization. Each worker receives a training set. The simplest case is just they all receive the same training set. Um, and each ra uh, uh, worker randomly permutes the order of the training data. That's important because if you want to do sequential analysis, you want to assume that it's uh, IID or exchangeable. Right, so. Then each worker is responsible for a subset of the rules. So if you Think about rules used in like boosting stumps. Um, they're base, you have a vector of some n features. You can um, give each of the workers one feature. You're in charge of finding weak rules for that feature. 
Okay. So the sets, so they're looking at different sets. Okay, so, um, so initial weights that you put are uniform, and initial rule, strong rule, is empty. And then for each worker, you have at the initialization, after the initialization, a set of weak rule that it is in charge of, and a sequence of examples. And then the algorithm itself is you initialize some counter over the examples, then you iterate, and for any rule in the set of rules that you're in charge of, um, you set the sum to zero, and you repeat. For each uh, rule, you update with the weighted error of that example. Okay, so this is the the this is the the, the 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 error. So it's one if it's correct and minus one if it's incorrect, and then you just multiply it by wi, and then uh, you just cumulative this sum, and then. Um, you compare, oh, here I, I have a typo. So you compare the, basically a stopping rule that says, like I said before, alpha <laughs> times t plus, plus gamma. Uh, so uh, yeah, alpha times t plus beta. And then if that rule fires, you basically um, set the new weak rule to ht, um, and then and broadcast that information to all of the other computers. And what do you do at this loop is, okay, you update i, and you repeat this until either this machine or some other machine found a weak rule. Okay, once anybody found a weak rule, you basically update to strong, reweight your examples. You don't really need to reweight them, you just need to update the weighting function. And uh, repeat, that's all. Yeah, I guess it, just finding a biased coin is, is, is enough. But what if you wanted to find the most biased coin? Um, that probably would take more communication, right? I mean, because in order to know if yours is the most biased coin, then you need to know what are the other biased coins. Don't and you expect from this test that the most biased is likely to fire first? Right. Okay. Right, right. I do, I do expect that. Maybe only a few rounds are enough? Uh, but it's not exactly that. It's, it's like the most bias, I mean, you have your assumption on bias, and then you have that for any assumption, the, 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 most, the most bias is likely to fire first. So, <coughs> so it's a kind of a weaker guarantee, yeah. Don't you want to run multiple wall tests in parallel with several different goals? Like you, you have one goal, your gamma. So right. You you know. Oh, okay, okay. So that, that's a very good question, and it has to do with the, with the tuning. Yeah. How do you want to tune? So, so as I said, I'm not so concerned with computational complexity, but more with, com with, uh, with communication complexity. So uh, how to choose this decision of where to send? Um, so I have a suggestion that is kind of going from the other side, right? So if you set this delta, uh, to be larger, um, then then you get a stronger. Uh, your, when you get something, you get a stronger hypothesis, but you might not get anything. Right. And um, so it'll take you a longer time to find a weak hypothesis, right? And you can get fewer broadcasts per second, right? So it all depends on what is your bottleneck. So in my experience, the bottleneck is the communication, not the computation. So what you do instead is that you adapt delta according to the communication load, right? If the, basically it's kind of like this. This is, each computer is trying to tell everybody else something new, okay? Right, trying to find something new to say. Now if it is basically listening to the, to the channel and everybody is speaking all the time, then it says, well, maybe I shouldn't talk so quickly. I, mean, I should find something really new to say, right? So that's, that's the intuition. Okay, so you start with some delta, and then each worker probes the network, and if the load is low, it decreases delta, and if the load is high, it increases delta. Now this is, I'm sorry, this, is, this, this delta is like a reminiscent from a previous version that I thought that the threshold should be fixed, but it's actually 
a slope. But, but the same thing holds. All right, so this is the tell me something new model, right? So basically, computers are not just sending information, they're really sending statistically significant information. Right? So they're basically sending only stuff that when they have the reason to believe that other computers will find it useful. Okay, so here's the general model. Each worker stores a state. So it has a state, the machine has a state. The state basically represents a distribution. If you talk about it in statistical terms, it represents the null distribution. The null distribution is what we believe the distribution is without any further evidence. Each worker searches the, for an alternative hypothesis that is significantly better than this hypothesis. Right? So we have a current uh, belief state, and we're looking for something that is significantly better. And we can check locally that it's significantly better. We don't need to talk with anybody about that. And you broadcast when a worker finds an alternative hypothesis that is significantly better, it broadcasts that information. Okay, so everybody, I'm telling this information. Now, thinking a little more, one of the big problems in distributed computation is actually reliability, right? So what if something here goes wrong? What if, you know, one of them um, falls asleep and then wakes up a year later and then has an idea, okay, everybody listen to me, this is the best, the best model ever. So then I decided to add uh, this thing that, that I call due diligence. So before, uh, so a model, um, th there is some kind of balance here between, between how much communication and due diligence, but the basic idea here, which is not exactly what I did in the boosting case, is that you just transmit the whole state the whole model, right? So it's the strong hypothesis that you're transmitting. And while there, I transmitted just the last additional. Okay, there is an advantage to transmitting the whole model because that's what I call due diligence. You get, you're, you're working on your stuff and then somebody says, okay, I have a great model for you, I have a new update. You want to make sure that it's really good before you accept it. So, um, Right, the model that you receive might be stale. It might be from one hour ago. Okay, so before accepting the new model, the, the worker compares its performance with its current no. It kind of says, okay, I have my model. This is a model. I can compare on my data how well they, they perform. And I'm going to accept it only if it's really better. If it's not better, I'm not going to accept it. So I call this probably approximately the best. Right? Just a name. Okay. Um, right, so just, just I'm going to talk about it a little bit more in a minute, but uh, you can think in distributed learning that actually each worker observes a, a slightly different distribution. And so some of, from some of the other workers, it wants to get the knowledge. From others, it doesn't want to get the knowledge, just because it's different. OK, so some more examples of TMSN, just so you see that it's not just something I invented for boosting, although I did, but yeah. Um, so K means plus plus. I apologize for the lack of references. I realized I should have had many more references. But how many people here uh, know K means plus plus? Everybody, okay, great. So, um, and then I'll tell you about stochastic gradient descent. And then about sensor networks, okay. So, uh, parallelize K means plus plus. You have the K means plus plus method, it's like an initialization for K means, but it has theoretical guarantees. Um, so you have a data set and um, what you basically do is you pick a random point to initialize the, the set of representatives. And then you define a potential for each point, which is, I don't know why this moved there, but uh, potential Y is the minimum over X of the distance between X and Y uh, squared. Okay, that's the potential. And then uh, you repeat 
Um, so basically, the so so basically, this this potential you you have a distribution that is a probability that's proportional to this potential, and that's the probability with which you accept the point, and you repeat. Oh, yeah, something here got switched. This one should have been here. Um, okay. So now what would be streaming k-means plus plus? So usually k-means plus plus is defined just in the batch setting. You define a distribution over all of your instances, and then you pick. But you can easily do it in a streaming way, right? You randomly permute the data, and you initialize, and then you define the potential in the same way, and then you repeat. Basically, you go through the examples, and for each example, you compute the minimum of some alpha times the potential and one, right? And then you pick a point according to this probability. And you just continue going on. Um, and the question is how to adjust alpha. So you basically want to adjust alpha so that the probability that alpha times the potential of y is larger or equal to one is small but not zero, right? So you want basically to use the full range. If you basically make them all small, then, then you're throwing away too many examples. Okay, so now that we have this, it's pretty clear how to make it tell me something new kind of model. So first of all, initialization. At the initial steps of k-means, so I've been running k-means on really very, very large data sets. So initial steps of k-means, there is no point to parallelize because you accept points so quickly that, that you might as well just run it all on one machine. But then you get into, the, into some st stage where the average time between accepts is large, is large, right? So basically, the points that you have are such good representatives that you only get a new representative every thousand iterations or every million iterations. Okay. So, um, so at that point, um, you have a, this initial set of representative that is broadcast to all workers. And the workers basically do the same process as before, but rather than just accepting the the point and adding it, you broadcast the point. Okay, so I found a point, I broadcast it to everybody else. And, um, and basically then you, if, if you got the point Z, um, either by yourself or by somebody broadcasting it, you add it to your set. Okay, yes? So uh, the other workers have done some work until they receive the new point. So right. they throw away all the computation they have done so far. Basically, they Well, the, the, their work was just throwing things out. So, uh, so whatever they have done at uh, that point, it they, they becomes useless, right? Right. Okay. right. But, but, I mean, they're, they're finding stuff that they realize is useless. Uh, yeah. yeah, they, they realize it's useless. I mean, it's not because of the broadcast they decided it's useless. They're searching for a good thing, and they didn't right. Okay, so can you use this for stochastic gradient descent? So this is some work with my student, former student Akshay Balsubramani. Um, this is just a one slide, one slide because you don't have every, all of the details worked out completely. But um, basically, each worker computes a running sum of single example gradients. Right? If you know about the mini batch approach to doing stochastic gradient descent, each one of the machines calculates a sum, sends it to the master, <coughs> then the master combines all of these sums, make a step, sends the new state back to the machines. This is different, okay? So this is basically, all of the machines essentially have the same, the same vector, the same current set of weights, which is the state, okay? And they're looking for a better state. Okay, but here they're just looking for a good gradient. So what does this look like? We want to identify if it's a statistically significant gradient. That's actually quite possible. Here the null hypothesis is that we have zero gradient. 
and, um, and, and one thing that we need to assume is for, for at least the simple result is we assume that we don't allow the gradient to be more than some constant, let's say one. Okay. So then it looks something like this. You have a true gradient and you have like a random walk that is drifting to in this direction, but it's also diffusing. It's also random walk, okay? So you can basically use a very simple rule like before. If you use the sphere of radius alpha plus beta t, once your walk is outside of that sphere that grows with t, uh, then you know that you have a gradient, and then you broadcast that gradient. Or you broadcast the new state after the gradient was added. Okay. So, so this um, I actually plan to to implement soon and see if we can actually get because now this is now in 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 deep neural networks. I mean, this is the method of choice, right? So, so it would be interesting if this can do things faster. So, what the different workers are working with different mini batches? Is that the um, um, the different workers? are basically working with a different random permutation of the same data, let's say. So each worker needs to have access to the full data set, or it's not that? Yes, yes, uh, yes. I, I, I know that, 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 that we worked a lot on like how to partition the data set. In my experience, that is not the problem. Having multiple copies of the data, that's not the problem. The problem is that if you have a huge amount of data, to bring it to the CPU through the memory hierarchy, that takes you a lot of time. Well, you may have to sort of spread it. What? You may have to you know, send it over the network and so on. That's Why? To different machines. Oh, no, 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 okay, so there's always an initialization. There's, you can't avoid initialization. So, so yeah, in this case, the initialization is essentially all of the machines get all of the data. Again, it's broadcast, so if you broadcast, everybody can get it. Okay, so now I want to do like a little bit of an extrapolation, go away from just nice theoretical results, um, and talk about sensor networks. So, Suppose we have uh, cameras or along a highway for monitoring traffic. We actually do have cameras for monitoring traffic. And the energy is limited, and the, uh, the cameras are often powered by small solar panels. That's, that's actually a fact. Um, and again, it's communication, not the data capture or computation that is the main power drain. So to basically communicate from one of these cameras back to headquarters, um, that actually takes a lot of energy. A lot of bandwidth and a lot of energy. So, strangely, when I, when I was searching for <laughs> images for this, uh, I actually ran into this phone app in Florida that does actually stream all of the cameras in Florida <laughs> to your phone. So, so it's kind of interesting, right? I mean, it's like this highly detailed image is on your phone, and you're driving on the highway, and you're going to choose your route according to that. I don't know. So, um, so yeah, yeah, it's kind of amazing. So I'm suggesting not to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. So, so what would be my approach to doing this exact same thing? Each camera stores a model of the traffic it sees, right? So there's a model, right? I mean, basically, how does the road look? I mean, the camera looks always in the same direction. Pretty much you can have the same, the same a model, how it looks at 10 in the morning, how it looks at 10 at night, how it looks, you know, all of these things. So that's all stored in the camera. Um, then you have car detectors, classifiers, that maybe somebody initialized, but you kind of train them on your data. And then you have the distribution of traffic, like number and velocity is a function of time of day and day of week, right? There is, in this place, there's always a traffic jam between 4 and 6.30, okay? So that's not news, right? So that's, the camera doesn't really need to send that. And distribution of car types, et cetera, et cetera. 
Okay, so the camera reports back changes in the model, right? So basically it sees over a long period of time that there's a gradual increase in traffic, changes in speed distribution, construction, and so on. Okay, so, so it basically has a model, the model changes over time, and it basically sends this model out when it knows that it's significantly changed. Now, there are other cameras in its area that look at a very similar highway. So they would actually, it would be useful for them to know what that camera thinks. Okay, and um, then it reports, of course, the outliers. So the outliers is what you usually really care about. You don't care to know, okay, there's again, you know, on I-95, a traffic jam, and now it's 5 p.m., and there's a traffic jam again. You want to know uh, if there's a gradual increase in traffic, changes in distribution, outliers, like a traffic jam at an unexpected time, or an accident, or a car parked on the side of the road, or a speeding car. Those are outside of your model, and so those you might want to send back. Right? So you minimize how much you're sending back. Okay, so going back to theory, what, what does it mean for theory? So this is a challenge for you all because I have no idea. So Turing machines are sequential. And that's a fact. And we're used to saying that parallel Turing machines uh, can be reduced to a Turing machine, but that's really only in the synchronized case, right? If they're not synchronized, mm, I don't know. I just don't know. So, so my question to you all is, can we have a theory of computation where both computation and communication are restricted? That's kind of high level question. I don't know the answer. And I want to plug in something uh, because I think that it's becoming more and more relevant and I think more people should look at it, is queuing theory. So the goal in queuing theory is characterize and analyze the behavior of a shared resource. So exactly what we're talking about. We have a shared network and we want to analyze what's really going to happen on this network. And things are not exactly what you expect ahead of time. Like for instance, if you have a queue where the expected time is, the time to serve a request uh, is lower than, uh, is higher than, sorry, is lower than the time between requests, you'd think in the expected level it's going to be fine. But in queuing theory shows you that if you have heavy tails, which is not an uncommon thing, it is not fine. It actually will have infinite delays. So the expected delay is infinite. Okay, so that in, in what I'm talking about, TMSN, the shared resource is the communication channel. And so this is a book uh, I highly recommend, Mor Harkol Balter from CMU. Uh, she's, she's doing, she comes from theoretical computer science and she uh, is now one of the leaders in thinking about queuing theory in the design of large computers. I think that to do parallel computation without queuing theory is very, very naive. Okay, to summarize, so I won't, hope I convinced you, at least some of you, that communication is the new frontier. Um, insisting on synchronization and common state is often expensive and unnecessary. TMSN uh, assumes that the data is generated by a slowly varying distribution. So it's a strong assumption, but it's an assumption that holds a lot uh, in real life. That you have a distribution, it's slowly varying, but it's still almost IID on the short scale. You communicate only the information that is new and surprising, implications, and relevant to this is queuing theory. Now one thing that I'll just end with that I think is kind of intriguing is how can you relate, how can you use this for privacy, right? We're sending much, much, much less information. Maybe if we're sending so much less information, we can protect the privacy, right? So maybe it's a potential way of getting to privacy through improving some other thing. Uh, so that's it, thank you. Yes. I didn't want to raise this point earlier because uh, I guess uh, Akshay is advisor, but <laughs> Akshay and I uh, wrote a paper last year showing that 
the right way to be doing this sequential hypothesis test is is using the law of iterative logarithm, which gives you a boundary of constant plus square root d log log d. And so I'm. I'm, I'm so, 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 all that this shows, all that this shows is that I don't talk with Akshay enough, right? So it's not, I, I definitely am going to use that. It's work with him. I just, you know, when I was preparing the talk, I didn't remember that, so that's all. No, so definitely we're going to use that. Okay, so so that was the answer to your question, right? Is there a better boundary? So they proved the better boundary. So, um, I, just to clarify, I think the difference Wald's sequential hypothesis test is optimal for for simple versus simple hypotheses. Testing okay. P equal to P one versus P equal to P two. Okay. And testing composite, that is P is equal to half versus P greater than half, something uh -huh. like that. Then it's no longer known to be optimal and I don't think it is. Because in our paper we see. show that it stops at the right time adaptively using square root T log log T you get So it's all bias, for any bias. for any bias for yeah, any gamma bias is delta then it'll stop after like one by delta square iteration. I see. All right, so things are much, much better than I knew, yeah. I, I, so I, but I, yeah, maybe we should talk more. I think, yeah, I think, I, I think we should talk, talk not just. Like, surely Akshay would have mentioned that, but I was like. No, I'm sure he has, I'm sure he has. I, I don't listen very well. So. Um, Any other questions? Yeah. 